So today, as we continue our series here in the book of Romans, we are in our eighth lesson. We are in chapter three, verses 27 through 31. As I was telling James earlier, I almost skipped this section because on the surface, it looks like it's kind of inconsequential. After explaining in big, beautiful theological language what salvation is, Paul then, he begins in verse 27 like this. Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. It's almost like Paul is rambling on for a little bit about the law after he finished making his main point. But the more I've learned about Romans, the more I see that these verses are incredibly critical and crucial in addressing one of Paul's primary concerns in Romans. Remember, the book of Romans is not just a treatise on the gospel. It is also practical counsel on a real life problem plaguing the church in Rome. The fact that Jews and Gentiles were not getting along. Now, if you remember, and I've stated this at least a couple of times, Romans was written right after the Jews returned to the church of Rome after being exiled or excluded for five years because Emperor Claudius had banished all the Jews from Rome, including the Jewish Christians. Then, after five years, Claudius lifted the ban, and so all of these Jews were coming back. But here's the thing, and this is what Paul wants to point out so succinctly in the beginning. Jews and Gentiles had all of these differences, cultural differences, stylistic differences, political differences, etc. And prior to this, the Jews had basically been in charge of the church because they had been the first Christians and then the Gentiles were added on later. But after they left, the Gentiles took charge. So the culture that used to be in charge wasn't in charge anymore, and therefore all of these racial and cultural tensions were flaring. Paul was writing to address them and to unify them. Now, by the way, I think it's important to note here that they didn't do the easy thing and just start a Jewish campus and a Gentile campus or two different churches on the opposite side of town, which would have been a lot easier. And that is because Paul's vision of the church was Jew and Gentile in one unified body, which is why multi-ethnicity is important in our church too. We say, and I say it a lot, our church should be to reflect the diversity of our community and to proclaim the diversity of God's kingdom. That is why Paul wrote this. Paul says the answer for this relational breakdown is the gospel. Therefore, he writes the longest treatise on the gospel in the Bible to address this relational problem, which in itself is a lesson to us. And everybody listen to this. This is extremely important. Relational issues are best addressed through gospel realities. Paul says that one of the primary things that is dividing the Jewish and Gentile Christians is how each approach the law. Jews interpret the law with a typical religious mindset. I obey, therefore I am accepted. They assume like every religion, except the gospel and Christianity, teaches that being right with God was determined by how well they kept the law. Their justification was found in law keeping. And that premise, Paul says, is what was fueling this division. Now you say, well, how is that? 
Well, when your justification is based on how well you do, you're always in competition with everyone else because how good you see yourself is determined by how you compare to others. And that results in pride and boasting when you do well and jealousy and despair when you don't. You see, the essence of pride in any, in any area, religion, sports, academics, parenting, ch culture, ethnicity, is competition. Pride sustains itself by comparison. So in religion, we're always asking, am I better than he is? Am I as good a mother as she is? And like I said, when you're doing well, comparatively speaking, that leads to boasting which then turns into judgmentalism, even disdain. And when you don't compare favor to others, that leads to an inferiority complex or despair, which turns into jealousy and hatred. Now, do you see why Paul pinpoints as a major source of division this issue? So, after explaining the gospel in detail in chapter three, that our justification comes not from how good we are, but is given to us freely as a gift from God, Paul says in verse 27, and everybody look at it very carefully. It can mean something much more profound to you. Where then is boasting? Somebody tell me. You don't have any. It's not based on you. That's why he says it is excluded. Because of what law? Well, you can't boast based upon a law because you can't keep it. The purpose of the law was to condemn you, not save you. It was to point you to Jesus. He says then, the law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. So here's his point. He asks you, how is boasting eliminated? By a law? Should God have said in there, you shall not boast? Would that have made any difference whatsoever? No, no, the gospel eliminates boasting by undercutting the very basis of pride. You weren't saved by anything you did. You couldn't keep the law. You were a miserable failure, Paul says. In fact, remember right up above in these verses, he says, there is none righteous, not even how many? One. In fact, you were so bad, Jesus had to die to save you. And that destroys the basis of pride. So he says in verse 29, or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. In other words, why do you think of yourselves in different categories? There is only one kind of person. You want to help me out? A sinner. There's only one. In chapter 3 and verse 23, and I'll paraphrase, he says, for all Jews, all Gentiles, all old, all young, all rich, all poor, all black, all white, all Latino, all Asian, all males, all females have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And there is only one way of salvation, Romans chapter three and verse 22 says. This righteousness is given through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. See, verse 29 says that there is only one God who justifies both the circumcised, the religious, and the uncircumcised, the irreligious, through the same means, faith. The gospel, Paul says, creates a new humanity that overcomes the divisions created by the boasting that comes from distinguishing yourselves from others. It is a new, inclusive humanity that overcomes the divisions that come from our pride. Now, you say, wait. Hold on just a second, you're going too fast. Only one God? Only one way of salvation? That doesn't sound inclusive. That sounds like it's the very definition of exclusive. 
Well, that's a pretty good point. But understand first that all religions claim they are exclusive. For example, if you say all good people of every religion go to heaven, that sounds inclusive, right? You see the bumper sticker that says coexist or hashtag coexist? Okay, well, if you say that, then who have you excluded? Bad people, perhaps? And I guess you get to define who bad is. And I suppose racists, rapists, child molesters are on that list. But the point is that everyone has a list that some people are on and some people are not. And you might say, no, 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 no. You misunderstand, I'm not religious at all. I don't exclude anyone for any reason. Well, you still have your standard as to what constitutes a good person. All religious and moral viewpoints end up being exclusive. Everyone, regardless of who they are or what they say, at the end of the day, everyone has, a, has a, a, an opinion about who is in and who is out. But the gospel of Jesus, you see, is a different kind of exclusivity because the gospel teaches that our acceptance with God is not based on anything about us. We're not accepted because of our moral record, our education, our marital status, our race, or our political viewpoints. God gives salvation as a gift to all who repent, obey the gospel, live in humility on the basis of faith in the Almighty. You could say, all religions are exclusive, but Christianity is the most inclusive exclusivity there is. You know why? What made the gospel in the first century so scandalous was not whom it excluded, but whom it what? Included, that's exactly right. The gospel overturns all bases for boasting that leads to division. So on the basis of all that, this is what Paul therefore then teaches us. And it hits right in the center of our culture, our religious traditions, even our language. We see three main dividers, three main places of boasting that cause division in our society. The first is the pride of race. For many, their ethnic identity becomes a way of distinguishing themselves from others. Jews in that day took pride in their Jewishness and Romans in their Romanness. But that leads to racism, feelings of superiority, and xenophobia. Today, people take pride in their Americanness or their Southernness or their Blackness or their Asianness, their Indian culture or their Latinoness or whatever it may be. A racial distinctive is core to their identity. And don't get me wrong, please don't. Our cultures are beautiful things, but there is nothing wrong with taking delight in them and feeling a profound sense of dignity that is attached to them. God created our various cultures like a many-sided diamond to reflect his glory as we glorify him by delighting in and displaying them. But when they become our primary distinguishing identities, which we use to set ourselves apart from others, they cause division. When this happens, Paul says, as he writes to us and perhaps looks at us today, you do not understand the gospel. There is only one race of people, the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And we have all, every single one of us, sinned. And our core problem, regardless of our skin color, our ethnicity, our background, our education, is the same. All have sinned, there is no distinction. And in, the, in alike, we all have one hope, the blood of Jesus cleanses us all, black, white, Latino, Asian, Arab, and mixed alike. 
Where is the boasting then? From where comes this sense of superiority about your race? Any kind of ethnic superiority is sinful and completely antithetical to the gospel. What gives us our worth and identity is not our Jewishness or whiteness or Americanness or blackness anymore. By the keeping of the law or by preserving the culture, no human before God is ever justified. In fact, after our identity in Christ, Paul says, all the rest of these characteristics that we use to define ourselves are garbage compared to the worth of our identity in Christ Jesus. When we become Christians, our cultural distinctives don't go away. They just become less important in our identity. See, God is not telling Jewish people to become Gentiles or Gentiles to become Jews. He's not telling white people to become black people or black people to become white people. He's telling all people in the church to identify first and foremost as kingdom people, having crucified their whiteness or blackness or Jewishness on the cross and regarding it as rubbish and giving them worth or justifying them before God. See, a failure to pursue diversity means that we have forgotten how far Jesus reached out to include us. He was infinitely more different than any of us are from one another. His choice is to make us his family. And the reason, and that's the reason why we can cross cultural lines and do the same thing with others. Yes, racial, Reconciliation and oneness can be costly and inconvenient to us, yes. And sometimes awkward and painful. But oneness cost Jesus his very life. Who are we to decide that the cost of pursuing multi-ethnic oneness is too high a price to pay? So there, Paul says, is the pride of race. Second, the pride of face and place. We think some characteristic or personal accomplishment sets us apart, justifies us before others. And the reason why is, we, is because we tend to see people in categories, the successful and the unsuccessful, the intelligent and the dull, the beautiful and the ugly, the fit and the fat, the rich and the poor. And we look down on those who are less than we are in those areas and feel intimidated by those who aren't. But do you not understand, Paul says, the gospel? First, do you realize how little of your talents you can actually take credit for? Your parents gave you your genes and God gave you the health and opportunity to pursue them. Do you really think, do you really think that if you had been born an orphan in a village in Samaria, would you have succeeded like you have? All of that is a gift. So pride about that is just wrong. And second, do you realize how worthless our talents are when it comes to the things that really matter? They couldn't justify us before God. Before God, there is only one kind of sinner, hopeless and dead. They are not successful, or there are no successful, high capacity sinners with a great capacity. There are only miserable, unpromising sinners who are just hopeless, dead sinners. And this may be a shock to many people, but heaven is not a scholarship program where God rewards the best. The best resume in God's eyes, Paul says, is a big steaming pile of rubbish. I mean, who cares if I'm not intelligent now? I'm promised that I will inherit the mind of Christ. It doesn't matter if I'm not beautiful now. 
Because one day, Jesus will make my outside match the beauty of my inside, which is the righteousness of Christ given to me. It doesn't matter if I'm not successful now. The weakest saint here has still been appointed by Jesus to reign with him as kings and queens eternally. So the pride of race makes no sense. And the pride of place and face makes no sense. But maybe, third, the most nonsensical of all is the pride of grace. And I know you see it so easily quite often. This is the pride that comes from having lived a moral or religious life. Or in other words, having avoided certain shameful sins or mistakes. You feel this the sense of pride because you've avoided the bad things you see other people fall into. You've never been to prison. You didn't get pregnant before you were married. You've never been fired from your job or have gotten divorced and you don't have a porn problem. And so now you feel a sense of distinction. Even set apart from others who have gone through some of these things. But Paul looks at you and says, but you don't understand the gospel. In Christ, there are no good people or bad people. People who have it all together or dysfunctional people. There are only bad, dead, sin-sick rebels without God and without hope in the world. That God saves freely by sheer act of grace. No merit of yours brought you closer to God. Your acceptance was all the gift of righteousness of Christ, Paul says, imputed to you freely. Yes, Christianity is exclusive. It teaches that the only way we can be justified in God's sight is by having Christ's righteousness imputed to us. But that is the most inclusive exclusivity that's ever been. Because it says anybody can come. Do you hear me? Anybody can come. Regardless of your past, your potential for the future, your problems in the present, the book of Romans and the gospel teaches us that anybody, anybody can come to God. And if this is not the greatest message that's ever been given to humanity, there isn't one. That's why none of us should ever be afraid. We should always feel triumphant knowing that Christ has work, done the work for us. Now the burden that we have is to love the way he loved us. Because when we love God the way he loved us, then we obey his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. And his commandments are not a burden. They will save you from heartache and harm, disruption, tumult, chaos. But it is each one of our choice as to what we want to do in any given moment. But as I close, let me remind you of this. At the moment when you're looking at a situation or a circumstance or a state of being, how you feel, trying to decide what you're gonna do, always remember that at the moment when you feel like not doing what God wants you to do because you're afraid is precisely the very reason why you should do it. Because your flesh is never going to agree with what God says is best for you. You have to impose it upon yourself by an act of the will. And you say, oh God, please help me by your spirit and through his power to obey your word. Because I know that if I do, you will bless me beyond anything that I am ever able to even begin to imagine. But it all begins and ends right here, church. It begins by understanding the gospel. The gospel is the power of God. 
Not that it channels the power of God, but it, it is itself the power of God for everyone who believes. Everyone. If you're struggling, and many of us are, the power is there. You can have it, but you must believe. If you need help from us today, if we can do anything for you, talk to you, pray with you, counsel you, or just listen, please don't hesitate to ask. Or if you'd like to come to Jesus today, we ask you to do that as we have some shepherds up here as we stand and sing.